subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates uh, a very warm good afternoon to everyone uh, thank you so much for joining us in another uh, interesting webinar of the speaking managing change series my name is himanshu and it is an absolute pleasure and an absolute honor for me to introduce our guest for today we are joined today by patmus kalshi mohan das bhai who is the chairman of the board of manipal growth Mr. Pai, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's an it's an absolute pleasure seeing you here. I mean, uh, it's 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 very rare that we hold conversations like like leaders like yourself who influence millions with their thoughts and millions with their ideas. Thank you. Uh, to 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 give to 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 give you a short brief about Mr. Pai. So before joining Manipal uh, Manipal Growth, Mr. Mohan Das Pai was a member of the Infosys Board of Directors and Head Administration Education Research. Finance, HR, and uh, and the Infosys Leadership Institute. He has he has over the years he has been a fantastic leader and has been a part in the senior management and senior leadership of various organizations. In the interest of time, I would rather keep the introduction very short and right jump right into the first question that I have for Mr. Pai. So uh, moving on with the uh, conversation, Mr. Pai, I think the first question that I have for you. is about your journey as a leadership it has been it has been decades since you entered the it has been decades since you entered the market as a professional and you are now today to stand at the pinnacle of what leadership is so very you know if you if you uh, if you if you can have some highlights of your journey how you became the phenomenal leader you are today right from when you you know started your journey did you see yourself becoming what you are today It, it it will be a great to have a, you know uh, to hear your side uh, thank you very much let me give some brief introduction about myself i was born a long time ago in the first decade of independence late in the decade my mother is a school teacher my father worked in a small company we were relatively well off my mother made sure that uh, we did a homework and we had to come first in class she made sure that we all studied well my father made sure that we had enough on the table and we are comfortable they both grew up in very poor circumstances and uh, you know they were educated up to class 10 but they wonderful people very very bright very intelligent they made sure that uh, three of us my younger brother my older sister got a good education and uh, i became a chartered accountant in 1982 i had a rank in my bcom examination university level and uh, at the ca examination both for the inter and final i also did a law degree while doing my ca i was very independent and i said i will not work for anybody after my chartered accountancy so i started my own practice well we didn't earn much money because you know in the 1980s nobody paid you money we did very good work we helped people build up industry and after some time a friend of mine asked me to come and run a financial services company a leasing company so in 1986 i became the executive director of a leasing company running that company so i never reported to anybody i just uh, you know i joined the job to run a business we built a business a good business then the family had a family fight <laughs> and uh, in 1993 i uh, i had bought some shares of infosys because a friend of mine was uh, you know the merchant banker and then after that uh, you know i went to the infosys annual general meeting i asked questions i went to the analyst meeting in october 1993 asked questions then they asked me to come and join i agreed to join them in uh, january of uh, you know 1994 uh, provided that i was a consultant and not an employee i didn't want to report anybody and in uh, so late september uh, narayan murthy came to my room and said you must join from tomorrow i spoke to nandan joy so i joined and i was the cfo immediately reporting to narayan murthy uh, who was the you know ceo and chairman and uh, the culture there was very different so my leadership journey started because i always wanted to be on my own so i never worked under anybody then i joined a very small company called infosys and infosys is an extraordinary company led by very very extraordinary people and my heroes were two people Uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Narayan Murthy. Why Mahatma Gandhi? Because I read his life journey, and to me, he epitomized all the good qualities that we should have as leaders. 
he was a visionary who came back to India, I think, in 1915 from South Africa. And the advice of Gopal Krishna Gokhale, I think he went around India to find out what India was and became a true Indian. He dressed like an ordinary Indian. He empathized with the ordinary person. And then he started the journey to get independence for this very large country, which has been impoverished by colonial rule for a very long period of time. And which was essentially a civilization. It didn't have a, uh, you know, existence as a country that you understand today, driven by borders, etc. It's a very large country with multitude people. Second, he was a person who led by example. He will never do anything unless he does it himself. The innumerable examples. Third, a man of immense courage. A man who inspired crowds of poor, impoverished Indians to stand up to the mightiest empire in the world and not to raise their hand. Now, that is very difficult. You can always tell people to come, gather arms and to fight. But, you know, he didn't do that. He said, the moral courage that you demonstrate is big enough to bring the biggest power on earth to his knees and give you freedom. And this theory was very clear that if you indulge in violence, violence will kill everybody because for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will make the world you know, blind and toothless. And on his call, crows of Indians, the poor, the impoverished, the Pardanashi woman came and marched for freedom, stood before the Latis of the British, were beaten on the head, fell down, but never raised a hand. So he was a man of immense moral courage. Next, he had the foresight to make sure that he stuck to his plan of non-violence. Chauri Chaura happened when uh, a police station was burned down by a mob and he called off the, I think, the Quit India movement, the freedom movement. He called it off. He said, you people are not ready. If you indulge in violence, I'm going to call it off. And then he developed a lot of leaders. He made sure that by leadership example, other people came to the fore. And you must never remember, he never promoted his family, unlike Pandit Nehru. He never promoted his family. His family was kept away from his political activities. He had a very difficult relationship with his children because of that. He asked them to make great sacrifices. He made his own sacrifices. So he developed very many leaders. In the freedom movement, there are thousands of leaders and all of whom responded to his call. And he made sure that there were so many leaders. And he made sure that he stopped his political activity and asked others to run. And then you're the extremely strategic person, a brilliant mind who understood people, understood what to do. Remember the Saul Satyagraha, by which he said, I'm going to march to Dandi, I'm going to make salt, and I'm going to demonstrate to you how to fight against the biggest empire in the world, which is the tyranny. And he marched and did it. And that took the entire world by storm. You know, just imagine <laughs> a half-naked fakir, like the British called him, walking to the coast to make salt. You know, this strategy thing, because that inspired people, you're showing defiance of a tyranny which oppressed you, which ruled over you without your uh, calling. And then after that, he made sure that he tried to keep people together. Keep people together by appealing to the innate conscience, to the spirituality, because he understood that India was a spiritual country for long, long years. And then he was a great negotiator. He could negotiate with the British. And remember the famous scene in Gandhi where he goes to meet the Viceroy and tells him, you know, I wanted to go back. Then the Viceroy said, you mean you want us to pack up and go? He said, yes, that's what I want. And then he was very pragmatic, extremely pragmatic. And in the Second World War, he made sure that India helped Great Britain fight the war because that time they were on the knees with the hope that we'll become free later. And then at the end of the day, he did not want the glory and the fruits of office, unlike his other fellow leaders in the Congress party, Indian National Congress those days. And he made sure the time when India got a freedom partition happened. And he was there in Naukali on that night because he said, I have to bring peace to people. And in that place where there was burning, there's everything else, he showed his indomitable courage by walking alone. Ekta Chalo Re, that's what Rabindranath Tagore said. And he did it. And he has been an inspiration for me in my leadership journey. Leadership by example, walking alone, making sure you have a vision, perseverance, the courage to say no, the courage to stand up to anybody, 
and above all keeping public good ahead of everything else knowing that the world becomes better you become better and making sure that you develop a lot of leaders under you and when i joined infosys narendra muthi was like that a great leader a brilliant man absolutely brilliant brilliant man unbelievably brilliant man i mean you know he is one of the if you look at business leaders in india after independence you have jd tata who were there for 15 20 years then the great dhirubhai ambani who taught india how to scale up right or wrong he showed india how to scale up maybe he broke some rules but he created a great industry which mukesh ambani has carried on and you see what happens and he created a scale for india he taught india how to create an industry of scale because for india which is a country of scale you need big industries then in the 90s the rise of narayan murthy who brought global respect to india working in a company driven by intellectual capital in high technology and answer the middle class dream of jobs and the industry that he developed grew to have 4.5 million people in jobs right now and muthi was a fantastic strategist he knew that to grow the company you have to plan ahead you got to get people you got to train them you got to build the infrastructure you got to market you got to sell and he was very very conscious of the brand and he told us even though we may be the small and not the biggest in the business we have to be the best so all of us aspire to be the best and we were a group of people who were rebels who spoke back to him and as a leader he made sure to listen to everybody you know for him the best idea always won not a designation anybody could walk into his room and quarrel with him or argue with him and he was fine okay there was no hierarchy we didn't have special toilets for anybody everybody went to the same toilet everybody went to the food court we were very egalitarian and he made sure when the salary hikes came the lowest level got the hikes first and they got a decent hike only after that the leaders got their hike in the end and if things went wrong they we cut the you know the salary the, the pain was taken by the leaders first and not anybody below that so he showed leadership by example and he stood up to everybody and he was frank and open and never bowed his head before anybody else and he was always honest always transparent always told the truth i remember in i think 2002 or 2002 i think in the quarterly call in april he stood up and said the fog and the wind screen the stock drop 40% in two days because you know the boom was over internet boom was over and you know he spoke and the man of indomitable courage and energy he used to be the first to come and the last to go a man of great detail he knew the macro and the micro he knew the business model inside out when i first joined there in april of 1994 He used a software called Quadro Pro on his laptop to create a business model showing all the key drivers of the business. And I know that time I didn't know what Quadro Pro was. I had not worked on a laptop because I had done COBOL programming on, uh, you know, on cards. You had those cards those days in the mainframe in the Indian Institute of Science. Then I looked at it and I remember that. And even today the model is fresh in my mind because that's all the business was. And he said. your business model has got to be so simple you wake up anybody at 3 o'clock in the morning and they should be able to tell you because if you don't make it simple people will never remember that don't complicate matters make it simple so our business model is extremely simple and we grew and grew and you want to set standards we are the first to go to nasdaq our annual report in 1995 was sold in the black market in mumbai we were very transparent first to give quarterly figures first to give in the gap of seven countries us gap and uh, first to do the adr first to have a large stock option plan by which we share the wealth with everybody more than 1000 people became dollar billionaires millionaires and maybe 20000 became rupee millionaires you are our office driver and we have only six of them not many and all the office boys all became millionaires because they gave them stocks we treated everybody equally it's a fantastic learning it's a great leader and i learned and i flowered under him i set standards in most things and when the time came in 2006 I felt 2005. I felt that I must step down and allow others to come the CFO. And uh, you know, in uh, 2006, I was uh, possibly you know 48. So, and anybody stepping down from being at the top for so long and being a director on the board of Infosys, then one of India's most valuable company, everybody went there, the bluest of the blue chip, because you are the prime. You know, was shocking to everybody. But I stood down because I said my team members should get that. day in the sun and i remember muthi telling me mon you have been in the limelight for so long are you sure you can be without talking to the media i said yes because from tomorrow i am a different person then he told me to take up hr i still remember when i had my first meeting with my hr team 
they came and asked me, sir, can we trust you? I said, why? No, I see for you're not being, you've been very harsh on us. Though I had made sure they got the stock option, they got the higher salary acts, they got variable compensation, they got loans to buy houses, etc. But still they have this feeling. When I told them, till yesterday when a CFO, when a person walked into my room, I used to see them at the net present value of a future stream of revenues. Now I see them as an individual who requires empathy, whose problems I must solve. Then in the next five years, we hired, you know, 200,000 people, trained 250,000 people. It is enormous. We built the largest global university in the world, in Mysore, where every year we train more than 35,000 people from the colleges. And they're the largest output of software engineers in the world after the United States and China. And if you go to Mysore, you'll see what a campus it is. I've not seen a university campus any place like that. Impeccable 11,000, you know, rooms, air condition, food courts, jogging track, cricket grounds, you know, clubs, swimming pool, everything, everything that you want, the biggest laundry in India, etc., and cinema theaters, multiplex, everything is there. Because we wanted to make sure our people had the best the world has to offer. I remember Sudha Shah, the captain, the coach of the Indian women's cricket team, they trained in Mysore for one month. She called me for London and said, sir, I want to talk to you. I said, sure. Sir, we beat England in lots. I said, fantastic. Congratulations. But that's not why I called you. Then what is it? He said, Lur, sir, I found the Lord's Stadium dirty. India, your Mysore is much better. Can you imagine? We come from a poor country and you go to England. And she said that. So I think, and then in 2011, I said 2010 late, I told Murthy, I want to step down. In 2011, I stepped down because I felt I want my life back. It's been 17 years in Infosys. I didn't aspire to be CEO because I've achieved most of the things I set for myself. I said, I must do something. Then 11, I met with Ranjan Pai. I was in the board in Manipal University for long. Then he said, why don't you become chairman of my education company? I liked education. I became, he said, we'll build five universities. We built two, one outside India, one in India. And then let's say, let's start a fund. So we started a fund, Arin Capital. And Arin has now got 14 different funds, 250 companies, $450 million invested. We got some five unicorns. And we've done extremely well. Beiju was the first company. You know, we put in 9 million at 20 million pre. Now he's worth 11.8 billion. A great entrepreneur. And I enjoy myself now. You know, I'm in the midst of all this excitement, watching young growth. So I've been lucky. I watched the rise of a great country, India, $275 billion in March 2019, 2000, I mean, March 1994 to $3 billion in March of 2020, growing at 8.5% a year for 29 years, uh, March of 1991. I watched the rise of a great industry, the software industry. Last year, March 2020, $150 million of exports. 4.5 million people employed, the largest software export in any country in the world. And they train so many people, out of 6 million people in the US, in software, 1 million are Indians. Of the 4.5 million, 2 million work for American companies. Out of 8 million working for American companies, 3 million are Indians. All because of this industry. It gave the answer to the middle class dream and changed India forever and put India firmly in the global map, got respect for India. I remember when I joined Infosys and I went abroad, people used to look at my passport, look at my face and they keep wondering who this joker. Now, after that, after Infi's listing on NASDAQ, when you went there, looked at the passport, so oh, you're from India, software engineer, fantastic, welcome to our country. That's the respect that we got because of that industry. And we showed the world. We had 100 prime ministers and presidents from all over the world, visitors. Zhu Rongji, the premier of China, came there in, I think, 2000, in China, from China too. Of course, China developed much faster than India. And then, you know, out of the top 10 software service companies by market value in the world, five are Indian, of the top five, three are Indian. Of the 2 million employees in the top 10, 1.5 million Indians. This industry really changed India. And the backward link is enormous. And now here I am working with startups and enjoying this exhilarating growth, great innovation, fantastic system. Let me give some data, then sign off. You can ask me more. This, there are 50,000 startups in India. We should be proud of them, young people who want to become entrepreneurs. 5,000 start every year, 10,000 got funded. They created $170 billion of value. $60 billion has been invested since 2014. We got 40 unicorns. By 2025, we'll have 100 unicorns. We'll create $500 billion of value, have 100,000 startups, and we will change the world. We will change India. India is the third largest country for startups. And this technology is changing everywhere. Young people have got a dream in this country. And my dream is by 2026, we'll be a $5 trillion economy by 2031, we'll be a $10 trillion economy and we'll be a country where everybody has got the necessities of life. Everybody and every young person can realize his or her dreams by just working hard and being smart.
So I have done my bit for my country. I helped build my country. I built the India brand. I'm doing it here now and I'll continue doing it. So my life has been a fantastic life, an unbelievable experience and great, great things to happen. And I enjoy every single moment of it. That is, that is truly fantastic. And, you know, uh, sincerely hats off to your vision for India and the work that you are doing for startups. It, it's awe inspiring to hear your journey and your inspirations all the way from Mahatma Gandhi to leaders like uh, Sri Narayan Murthy. And then, you know, in the process, you help so many startups become what and reach, you know, what they are today. Um, uh, this is, this is, this has been very, this has been indeed a very inspirational journey. Uh, I'll move on to my next question. And this is, you know, particularly of, of course, you mentioned about the role or role of Mahatma Gandhi during the colonial times and how he actually single-handedly, you know, stood in front of the Britishers and, you know, he was a leader that people looked up to. Right now, the times that we are in currently, this is, these are very strange times. I mean, there is no colonial rule as such, but people are going through a lot. People are very uncertain about the future and many are looking at, you know, political leadership, corporate leadership and, you know, of course, leaders like yourself who are there, who are, you know, who are there to show their insights and you know guide the people that's what people are you know looking at at the moment so if if you were to share your thoughts on what probably the role of political leadership would be in the post covid 19 reconstruction how would you comment on that what, what would be your thoughts on this well let me say look politics is a very very hard work we must respect our political leaders and not abuse them like so many people do and all the people who abuse them don't have the capacity to be political leaders. Because to be a political leader, you must have the ability to be elected to power. You get legitimacy. That means people must respect you. People must come and vote for you. And they must know that you'll do a job. Your whole day is filled with meeting people, replying to them, meeting their aspirations. It's a struggle to get into power. You need perseverance. You need thinking. You need communication skills. And you need the vision to last a long while. It's a very tough life. And every politician, every politician, single one of them, is doing public service. Now, you may say they're corrupt, they're this. But look, all this largely happens because none of the people who criticize them ever pay for the elections. Coming to elections requires money. Who pays for it? If you don't pay for it as a contributor, what will they do? They have to raise money. Many of them do things illegally. Of course, they make sacrifices. They don't have time to spend with their family. They're not in doing business. So they have to earn their living too, right? And we must make sure everybody has a decent living. So society is at fault. If at all, there are challenges to the political system. And all political leaders of all parties always want to work for the welfare of the constituency and the country. Because the democracy is a system of competitive lobbies. In a democracy, everybody is a lobby. We have a caste lobby. We have a religious lobby. We have a geographical lobby. We have a business lobby. We have a labor lobby. We have all kinds of lobbies. They all want everything. And what is the role of a politician? The role of a politician is to listen to everybody, find out everybody, what everybody wants, give a little bit to everybody, keep the hope and keep the show running. Because you know you can't satisfy everybody all the time. And he has to balance the needs of every constituency and make sure there is peace and tranquility and everybody has hope. And that's what they've done. And all the political leaders from Pandit Nehru up to you know, Shastri and then to Indira Gandhi and then after that Indira Gandhi to you know, possibly uh, Muraji Desai, and then uh, from there, we come to Rajiv Gandhi, and from Rajiv Gandhi to I.K. Gujral, right up to you know, Prime Minister Vajpayee, then from Vajpayee to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, and now Prime Minister Modi. All of them are good leaders. They've done a great job. Well, you can always criticize them and point fingers into them, but compared to what they have done and sacrifice they've done, they're all great leaders. Some of them you may quarrel, you may criticize them and all that. So now post-COVID, post-COVID, what are the challenges? The biggest challenge for India is to make sure that young people have jobs. Because remember, we have been producing 25 million babies a year for the last 30 years. Luckily, our population has stabilized because fertility today has come down to 2.0. The whole of South India is 1.7. And replacement rate is 2.3 for India. We are below that. So we could age much more happily than people believe. And if you look at the latest fertility all around the world, the world's population is supposed to go to 11 billion as per UN. By 2100, it's not going to go there. People say it'll stop at 9.6. And people say by 2060, India will start aging. And by 21 India, 2100, India's population actually declines substantially because, you know, fertility has come down. So 
Out of these 25 million young people, 15 million will want jobs because the balance 10 million will drop out, they'll get married or whatever it is. And we are producing about 10, 11 million jobs, maybe two or three million good jobs. The rest of them are social jobs. So what is the solution? The solution is we have to grow. And we have to grow at 78%. We have grown in the last many years. The numbers are all real. Don't get carried away by all this malcontents who tell you all kind of stuff. We have grown and we have to grow faster. But to grow faster, we have to address the basic challenges of Indian society. What is that? 43% of our people depend on agriculture, which is maybe 15 to 17% growing at 3% a year. And the income in agriculture for every individual is not more than 55,000 rupees because our per capita income for the whole country is 1,50,000 rupees at market value. That is last year, not this year. This year has come down. And in, in services, where possibly 30% of people work, 30, nearly 30% 30 are less than that work, the per capita income is 2,25,000. And in, uh, uh, you know, in uh, industry, uh, where maybe another 30% our 28% people work, or 27% people work, uh, the per capita income is about 1,65,000. So we have to get people off the land. There's 60% of the population depend on agriculture nearly 20 years back. Now it's come to 43%. Every year they decline by 1% or so. So we have to make sure that farmers get, you know, the maximum price. And that's why this farm reform is important, as done by Prime Minister Modi. And we have to make sure they do well. And we have to make sure that we grow the country. Second, we have to have urbanization. The world is 52% urban, China is 59% urban, India is only 35% urban, maybe slightly more, because urbanization creates concentration of human activity. Concentration of human activity creates specialization. Specialization increases productivity, and increased productivity leads to higher income. Now, we have to urbanize in the smaller towns, not the big towns. We've got 7,000 census towns. We are going to urbanize, put infrastructure there, and get in labor-intensive industries there. India I spoil the chances by not focusing on labor intensive industries like China did in the beginning because you know labor is our strength. We have got a lot of human capital. We didn't focus on them. We create difficulty for people to have labor intensive industries by having very bad laws. And Prime Minister Modi has done the same by taking away 45 labor laws and making it into four different courts. And that will really help create a lot more jobs. So we need urbanization. And in this new urban centers require uh, you know, to have labor intensive industries. And next, we have to make sure that we create infrastructure. Our supply chain costs are 14% of GDP. After GST has come down to 12%, we've got to bring it down to 78%. Because manufacturing in Nagpur and shipping it to Bombay for exporting, if the cost is too high, you can't compete with China. And China supply chain costs are just 6% of GDP. We are 14, now 12. So I think we need to create those roads, railways. Railways, you know, Piyush Goel, Minister Piyush Goel says rails, railways are now running at 45 kilometers an hour, as again 24 kilometers. We didn't need them to run at 60 kilometers an hour. We need to go from Bangalore to Delhi, 1,700 kilometers in maybe one day by a truck. Now, trucks used to go 250 kilometers a day. Now, they're going about 450, 500 kilometers a day because we built the entire highway system. The cost will come down, efficiency will increase, and that's important. We've got to build infrastructure. And then we've got to educate our people. We've got to improve school education. You know, there are 265 million children in school. Maybe 50% get a decent education. 50% do not get a good education education in uh, villages, in the rural areas, etc., in the government schools. And we have to make sure our universities grow up. We have a gross enrollment rate is only 26.5. Only 26.5% of young people go to college. Whereas the United States, I think, is about 80%. China has gone to 50%, etc. We need to take it up to 50% by 2030. And that is a new education policy uh, principle. And then we've got to develop this human capital and make sure they get jobs. And then we've got to deliver justice to people. We've got a broken down justice system where to get justice, make, it takes you 15, 20 years. We don't have enough judicial capacity. We just got 18 judges per million population. We need 50. And we have to expand capacity, ease of loss, et cetera, and make sure that ease of life comes to everybody. We've got to invest in our cities to make sure there's mobility so we don't get stuck in traffic. There are a lot of things to be done to develop this country. But I'm glad to say that all the things are happening. And the most important is, you must have a country where everybody gets the bare necessities of life, food on the table, power in the switch, water in the tap, a toilet in the house, a you know, roof for the head, a house for them to stay, road to the house, a mobile connection, a bank account, internet connection, an education for the children, and uh, decent access to health and to jobs. And Prime Minister Modi is doing all that in a very big way. 
And I want to put it on record. No Prime Minister has done as much for the poor of this country in five years as Prime Minister Modi did in his first five-year rule. And that's all based on data. Now, many people may quarrel, but look at data. It's remarkable. He continued the work done by other Prime Ministers, but he did much, much more in five years. Because this country is not built by one people. So this country is built by a lot of people who have been our leaders, a lot of political parties, etc. And, you know, it'll be built by a lot of people. We are a democracy. People will come and grow. But we've got all these great leaders. So we've got to do that. And that's happening now. By 2022, hopefully, we all believe that every Indian will have the necessities of life. Poverty will come down to maybe 5 6%. And, you know, that will be the country. And then we'll take off. And geographically, with the $3 trillion economy, with the industry trying to go away from China because of many issues, uh, our day in the sun has to come. But we have to be more productive. We have to invest much more and everything else. And this is a challenge for all of us. It's an exciting challenge. And the most productive, the fastest growth for India in our history will come in the next 10 years. That is, that is indeed. And that's actually very interesting, the, the, uh, the couple of points that you covered uh, during, uh, during this answer. Uh, one, of the, one of them that you know, particularly really intrigued me was about the corporate leadership. And you know, one of our, uh, our viewers is also interested in knowing this. So, if I if I have to put across this in the form of a question to you, how would you feel that you know, uh, current currently given the situation of the economy, how is the corporate leadership uh, poised to set the economic engine in motion once again? And what do you feel that where do leaders like yourself, you know, uh, stand in this and you know, playing? Uh, what, what is the role that you are going to play in this? You know, India has very good corporate leaders. And we are harshly critical on ourselves. We've got very good corporate leaders. I can name 100 great leaders who have done well. But barring a few, they have one challenge. They don't think of scale. So many of them are very happy addressing business in India. India is a $3 trillion economy. The world is a $82 trillion economy. The IT industry addressed a $82 trillion economy and has done so well. Now, if you have just address a $3 trillion economy, there's a limit to what you can do. So we need giant companies, companies of the size that IT industry is, TCS is, Infosys is, company size Reliance is, Reliance Geo is, and the dreams that Mukesh Ambani has. I think we need the company of that size. We need company of the size that, uh, you know, maybe the Billas are in uh, cement, 100 million tons. So we need our corporate leaders to scale up 10x in the next maybe five to seven years. Treat the world as a market and to manufacture and to sell, to export and to make sure that they scale up. To me, the scaling up issue is the biggest challenge that India has. If they're able to address the global markets and scale up, they got everything. They got technology, they got human capital, they can access capital, they can access everything. They just should have the big dream to do it. And now I think more and more people are looking at that because many of them are maxing out on India. Because India today, you know, India is a wonderful country, second largest producer of steel, 125 million ton capacity, 100 million ton production. Second larger manufacturer of cement, 545 million tons capacity. And this year will make maybe 350 or 375 million tons of uh, cement. And if you look at steel, cement, metals, and you look at uh, you know, agriculture, second largest producer of wheat, second largest producer of rice, second largest producer of uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, largest producer of milk, largest producer of spices, largest producer of sugar, largest producer of cotton is enormous. So we must become an export powerhouse. Because the markets in India are too small for us. Every country that has developed has developed by addressing the global market and exporting. India has missed the bus because of a very bad policies, which now people are understanding. So I think corporate leaders should realize that they've got good governance. They know how to manage the company. They've got human capital. They've got everything else. I think many of them after the pandemic are realizing that. They become much more efficient. They've been hit by the survival tanks, you know, because pandemic, everything coming to a stop was shocking. So they are tightening their belts, they're becoming more efficient, working harder. And I'm sure after the pandemic, they will look at it very differently and they'll make new alliances and they will uh, grow. And as far as I'm concerned, my life is very clear. I'm going to focus on innovation, focus on startups. I want to get more investment startups in this country. I work with the Japanese Neti in the last three years to make a fund of fund for India. And I will make sure that I mentor many companies and help them become unicorns and grow, talk about it, bring the brand to India. That is that is that is indeed you know that is indeed very interesting and you know this was uh, you know this was part of my next question as well because of the work that you've done for entrepreneurs because of your support for the startup ecosystem within the India I wanted to really wanted to know your thoughts on what the current startup uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem in India is 
and what does the future look like for startups what are your thoughts on that you know people don't understand how digital india has become let me give you some data 1.2 billion mobile connection 900 million mobile phones 250 mobile phones sold in this country 165 million smartphones sold in this country the cheapest data plan in the world you know on uh, jio uh, every individual uses an average 14 gb of data a month on uh, airtel they use 17 gb of data with the largest in the world for such a low cost and then we have the it software industry the data we gave then we have the government which has done remarkably well 400 million people have opened bank accounts we have the india stack a basic building block created by volunteers in bangalore by which you got aadhar 1.2 billion people have a number and then you got uh, upi which this month will have 2 billion transaction last month 1.8 billion transactions so you can transfer money from one mobile to another in 30 seconds without paying any cost and then you got a data store free of cost you got e kyc which is allowing you to open uh, you know mutual fund account which is boom and uh, you open insurance accounts etc and jio could give 600000 sim card just because of the e kyc of uh, the india stack and then uh, you also got uh, under the india stack you got uh, the jandan trinity you know jam jam as um, prime minister modi call it he has used that very well to transfer 12 and 1/2 lakh crores to people in the last 6 months 445 schemes have become dbt and you know 8.8 you know 8, 85 85 million women get free gas stoves or subsidized gas and about uh, 800 million people get free rations in this country almost free 1 rupee a kg that's almost free and then uh, 200 million people women got uh, dbt money in the bank accounts 95 million farmers got money and all that happened just because of digital india has gone fully digital the whole country has gone digital you know after the pandemic you know all your supplies come through e-commerce in the bigger cities in tier 2 tier 3 cities you got e health you have done e consultation e education for 40 50% of india's children in the colleges maybe 60% and then uh, you got e entertainment to hotflix netflix and so much so all the digital thing has come today and the, the india has gone digital with the ventures it's always there but you know it's been accelerated so i do think that uh, in the future all the, the startups are going to come up in a much much bigger way look at aragya setu right that app is got 140 135 million downloads it's the fastest to go to 50 million downloads in 13 days pokemon did it in 19 days so you know that is the fastest in the world and now we are going to have a health stack driven by government because prime minister modi has got that a big uh, aishman bharat uh, insurance program where 500 million people will be insured and already about uh, 12 and 1/2 million 1.2 crore people have got the benefits uh, for health benefits and that's going to expand and that's going to capture all the data and the data will be the largest collection of data on the human being anywhere in the world so they can do ai and everything else in india just two years behind the silicon valley in terms of technology because we don't have enough capital we don't have enough research done in the universities so i think this digital way this scaling up and a good uh, good system and growth coming back in the next 6 months uh, is going to change the market for startups just today i read that e-commerce in this uh, festival season will be around 7 billion dollars that nearly 50000 crores 50000 crores in one month that is very very good for e-commerce right well they may make a lot of losses because they're giving subsidies but whatever it is you know every young person wants to be a startup every one person has got a hero who is a billionaire so i think the startup ecosystem is changing the culture of india is pervading and giving a dream to every every single young person anywhere in india because we are all part of the same platform we all been connected by the internet we all have got a smartphone or will hope to get a smartphone and we will be connected through a wireless device a wireless uh, connection at a very cheap cost at 100 rupees almost everybody can afford it so i think the startup ecosystem is going to be the next great engine of growth to grow india in the next 10 years that's that's absolutely true and you know uh, of course uh, since you've been also uh, helping a lot of startups we are bringing in uh, innovation within the indian uh, you know within the indian economy so yeah i'm i'm trying to help a lot of startups i mean i mentor i speak at events i talk to them whenever they come you know in our entire group we get 3000 companies approaching us every year for capital 3000 I don't talk to all of them. The people talk to all of them, but we get so much. I think you know, I build the brand. I help them get capital. I talk to government to change policies. I talk to the finance ministry. I talk to Piyush Goyal, Minister Piyush Goyal. I talk to Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad. Try to do many things. Well, I think all of us have to do a bit. 
absolutely that's uh, that that that's how you are also you know helping the entire ecosystem grow so uh, i'll i'll move on to some of the final questions that i have for you and one of the questions which is very exciting and you know uh, really we really wanted your thoughts on that is about the education ecosystem in india now covid 19 has led to the closure of schools colleges universities traditional system of education that was in place has been majorly disrupted now we are seeing the entire education taking over taking place over the online space so how what how do you feel that you know this entire traditional model of ecosystem how is it going to survive post covid or what you can or or how do you feel the future of education in india is going to look like well let me take school education then college education in school education we got 265 million children in school maybe 15 million Uh, don't make it to school, and uh, out of hundred kids in class one, eighty completes class ten. About eighty percent, that is sixty-four pass, and out of sixty-four, fifty-six go to class eleven and twelve, and there too about maybe eighty percent pass, maybe thirty-five, forty pass, and twenty-six go to college, right? And that percentage is improving for all communities except Muslims. Uh, Muslim enrollment is only about five point two percent of all the kids in college, uh, students in college. Though they make up 15% of population, but their enrollment has been going up by 7.2, 7.6% a year for the last eight years. So there is great hope. I think everybody is coming coming ahead. That's good news. Now, as far as school education is concerned, we have a big digital divide. 50% of kids are in private schools. Out of the 50%, maybe 50% are in good schools where technology is available. 50% are in lower schools because 75% of them in private school pay less than thousand rupees. Uh, less than pay less than thousand rupees a month, and maybe fifty percent pay less than five rupees a month. So I think there's a problem about a digital divide which government has to solve, and I think it's time that government use the universal service obligation fund, our fifty thousand crores collected from all of us because we use a mobile phone to buy uh, maybe tablets for ten crore children. So ten crore children, ten thousand rupees is about one lakh crore, and use fifty thousand. The rest government can put because government, state, and centre spend five lakh fifty thousand crores, I think, a year for school education. So I think the big challenge is that, and we got enough apps, we got enough content, we got everything else to give it to everybody. And if we're able to give everybody a tablet and access from class maybe five onwards, class four onwards, then we will see a sea change in the next three to five years because young children are curious. They know what to do. They have to be connected. They have to be given the content. The physical content is difficult. They'll get rich multimedia content. They will get uh, videos. They'll get so many things. Imagine all the kids see, uh, you know, David Attenborough's uh, documentaries on the planet. Right? It is amazing. Huh? I mean, look at that. They will, they will, they will, they will jump up and down with joy. They'll see so many things on this beautiful planet of ours, but they can't see. They should be given that. Then I think you know this. There'll be school. Will be school education will be offline, online. Maybe on, online will be maybe thirty forty percent because school in the school education you have to go to school you have to go because you know when you spend twelve years in school you grow up you meet your own peers you learn to negotiate you learn to share ideas learn to have secrets talk to them work together create a a culture of working in teams live learning how to live in society create networks create friends that's very important you can't do online become an island of yourself that's not done online is only an input for you to do much better. And give you access to information on an asymmetrical basis. Now, when you go to college, well, you know, online could be maybe 45, 50 percent there, less than much more than schools, and there you can get access to content. And the new education policy makes sure that education will be flexible, is suited to the individual rather than one size fits all, with great flexibility given to universities and colleges to scale up, to improve quality, to do more research, and to give more option to people, have great transfers, and all the nice things there. So I think in the next ten years we will see a transformation of education because what the new education policy does is liberate the school, liberate the school teacher, liberate the school management, liberate the universities, give them a lot more freedom to experiment and to do many things. And the rigidity in the system and bad government control will hopefully go away. But government has a role to play because government has to underwrite school education, make sure that every child gets education up to class twelve. Every child should get up to class twelve. Class eight, ten is not enough. Up to the age of eighteen, they have to be in school. You know, Amitya Sen answered this question that a bad school is better than no school uh, because you know when you go to school you learn a lot, you know, and that learning is, uh, you know, is, is is something fantastic. And I think that's where people grow up, right? You grow up from a small child to a young adult and to an adult, 
and that the experience you develop your world view and that's important even if you go to a college somewhere i think is important now after you come to college are there going to be jobs there are going to be enough jobs but we have to live by this to grow the economy so i think education will be online offline more of online will come people will have much more choice there'll be a fantastic amount of content is already happening and i think things are going to be better absolutely and certainly looking forward to a massive transition within the education sector i uh, now you know before i move on to towards uh, concluding this session i really would like to know your call for your piece of advice or your words of wisdom to whoever would be watching this video it could be students it could be corporate professionals as well as you know leaders within the industries which are already present there so well i would just tell i would just tell yes. young people follow your dream dream big follow your dream whatever it is follow your dream live your life on your terms and i'm sure you'll succeed and the people in business aim to scale aim to grow big and and please have integrity in business please have quality please be very global and to everybody who aspires to be a leader learn lessons of leadership from gandhi ji's life assimilate those values and remember integrity leadership by example and you know hiring people better than you to work with you and making sure that you think in advance are going to be qualities that are going to really stand you in good stead and i think uh, you know the opportunities are immense we can make our own opportunities because in a growing market in a growing country with everything coming together and with a great investment infrastructure there never been better times that's absolutely true and thank you so much for such words of wisdom i'm sure whoever would be listening to this or whoever would eventually listen to this will actually you know learn a lot from this session and you know would find this session extremely informative thank you so much uh, mr pai it was such a pleasure interacting with you for sharing your very 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 golden words of wisdom and we really enjoyed the session it, it was particularly very inspirational for me personally and i hope it's the same to the viewers that this eventually video will be going for thank you so much for your time thank and you. i really hope you have a fantastic weekend and take care and stay safe thank you so much thank you thank you very much himanshu thank, thank you, you. bye bye